Mercer County Baptist Church, I'd like to ask you to please stand and join us as we sing hymn number 249, Heaven Came Down, hymn number 249, Heaven Came Down. Well, praise the Lord. Tell you what, we had a good day in the Lord's house this morning, and uh, what a beautiful baby dedication uh, that we got to enjoy this morning. And, uh, and little Emmy Lou, I said, I, I hope you get to see the video. She was smiling at me the whole time. It was wild. I kept looking at her going, man, this baby's just smiling away. And uh, it was absolutely amazing. And oh, she's sleeping now. So praise the Lord. And oh, you have another boy. Look at that. And uh, you're raising mine. You can have them. I got three others. But, uh, but praise the Lord, it was a special day, and I'm glad your parents got to come today. It was, it was good to be able to see them, and uh, what, a, what a day in the Lord's house we had. But looking forward to a good night tonight, and had a good meeting this afternoon regarding the big day, and uh, got a bunch of responsibilities divvied up, and so that was really good. We praise the Lord for all that. But let's get our hearts and minds fixed upon the Lord tonight. Uh, that's what we're here for. That's what it's all about, is pointing people unto the Lord Jesus Christ. Brother David Kelsey, I'm glad you're here tonight, my friend. I want you to, if you would, lift your voice. And ask God's blessing on the church service tonight, if you would, please. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for allowing us to come to church in, in our free will now, Lord. As there being all our rights are being taken away from us, God. And uh, Lord, we just ask you to bless the service tonight, bless the preacher, bless everybody that's here, Lord. Amen, amen. We may be seated there in the congregation, but let's keep those hymn books out and turn to hymn number 70, The Unclouded Day. Hymn number 70, 
the unclouded day. Oh, they tell me of a home far beyond the skies. Oh, they tell me of a home far away. Oh, they tell me of a home where no sword clouds rise. Oh, they tell me of an unclouded day. Oh, the land of cloudless day. Tell me of that land far away Where the tree of life and eternal blue Sheds its fragrance through the unclouded day On the land of cloudless day On the land of an unclouded sky Oh, they tell me of a smiles on his children there and his smile drives his sorrows all away and they tell me that no tears ever come again in that lovely land of unclouded day on the land of cloudless day on the land of an unclouded sky Man, let's go ahead and turn all the way to hymn number 68. Face to face, hymn number 68. Face to face. Marco, I appreciate that. Brother Jeremy, a wonderful uh, selection of music there. And uh, we will look over 
uh, our announcements here this evening. And uh, again, we're not uh, happy that we missed our ladies' prayer time tonight. Our meeting that we were having uh, carried a lot longer than what I thought it would. But uh, there's a lot going on on October the 31st, so it was necessary uh, for that. And uh, so anyways, but it was, it was, uh, it was a good time uh, there. And uh, let me, let me uh, see here. If I could, uh, Brother Haneke and Brother Joel, uh, when you see him, Miss Karen, okay, he's in the back. Just, just let him know that after church, let's see in Miss Marla and Miss Linda, where you at? And uh, we'll have a, a quick meeting tonight. Uh, I won't take long at all. I just want to talk about a couple things. But anyways, y'all can stick around tonight just for about five minutes. That will be a tremendous blessing there. Uh, let's see here. So ladies, you missed your prayer time, but we did our best to pray about what we thought might be on your hearts tonight. And uh, But hey, listen, don't be afraid to go to one another and just say, pray for me. And uh, you know, people do that to me all the time. And uh, pray for me, preacher, pray for me. And, uh, and yes, I will. And I do my best to remember to pray for them. And uh, sometimes I'll just pray with them right then and there, you know. And, uh, and so that's uh, uh, always a good idea. But ladies, bear one another's burdens there. Uh, SCBBI will be Tuesday at 6.30 right here. And, uh, and so we appreciate your faithfulness to that. Uh, then obviously Wednesday at 5.45 is puppet practice. And then we have church Wednesday at 6.30. Now this Thursday will be the last Thursday uh, that we have soul winning. So it'll be 6 o'clock on Thursday uh, and then after that, we're going to be moving soul winning uh, to Saturdays. I know we're going to wait till time change. I'm not going to wait anymore till time change. I'm going to go ahead and move soul winning to Saturdays uh, and, uh, and, and knock on doors that way. And uh, that'll be a tremendous blessing. But this week, it's Thursday at six, six o'clock, Thursday at six o'clock. And after that, it'll be Saturdays from this point until the time change in the spring. Uh, let's see here. We talked about our big Sunday already in our meeting, but I'll remind you of it. It's our fifth Sunday fellowship plus Roundup Sunday plus Pastor's Bible Party. And there's a lot going on. A catered meal for all to enjoy, pie contest, Western Attire costume contest, pony rides, bounce house, hay rides, cotton candy, snow cones, games, candies, and much, much more. Uh, we enjoyed our planning meeting tonight. If you say, well, I wasn't able to come, but I sure would like to be a part of it, uh, uh, do us a favor. My wife's the one who kept the list of all the different volunteers and what they were going to be doing. Uh, so go see her and she can fill in you somewhere uh, and, and get you plugged in so you can uh, serve in that uh, environment there. But it should be a great day. And I want you to be praying for it. Pray for souls to be saved. Uh, pray for the bus route. We're going to be working very diligently. We've been getting lots of pointers uh, from folks who've had successful bus ministries in the past. And, uh, and so we'll be praying about uh, trying to get that bus route really built up here in the next coming Saturdays leading up to October 31st. Uh, teenagers are having a, a teen, is it teen baking or teen cooking championship? Is it both? Baking and cooking? Both. both. All right. Uh, we need something savory and something sweet. And, uh, and so uh, the teenagers will be given a bunch of items, uh, 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 grocery items. Uh, girls will be going to one location. Boys will be going to another location. They'll be meeting up at an undisclosed location. <laughs> uh, we'll know, they'll know where that's at. And, uh, and then there'll be, there'll be some judges. Whatever home you end up at, just let the homeowners be the judge there. And uh, of which team wins and which team did the best job of baking the items there. And uh, you probably take volunteers tonight. Who wants the teenagers to end up at their house and, uh, and they could judge the food and play volleyball in the backyard or games or something like that, you know, it'd be a good idea. But if you want to help Brother Marco with that, see Brother Marco. I'm sure he'd be appreciative of your help in that area. Uh, all right. And then also, the, don't forget about the bridal shower for Miss Erica Johnson. We said earlier this morning, she's registered at Amazon and Bed Bath & Beyond. Ladies, that's at 2 o'clock on November the 13th. I uh, hope you've blocked that out of your calendar and you plan on going and encouraging this young lady in the Lord. And uh, I know that'll be great. And then, uh, and I think us guys are going to do something with you. You just don't know about it yet, but we're going to have some fun. He's not registered, but he said he's registered at, uh, what do you say, Texas. Texas Roadhouse, Bass Pro Shop, and Academy Sports. And so if you want to help him with that, you can. Uh, let's see here. Uh, church family Thanksgiving dinner is always just a wonderful time where we get together and enjoy one another. On that particular week, that's the week of Thanksgiving. We move our Wednesday service. We pick it up and we drop it on Tuesday. And, uh, and we have uh, Tuesday night services. It's all the fixings, and we have a, uh, like a praise time, uh, not to have the wrong connotation there, but it's a time where we give testimonies and, and a singspiration, and we just enjoy ourselves on that evening. It's a wonderful, wonderful service there, and a time of testimony and devotion. Uh, and then on that Wednesday, on that week only, there will be no Wednesday night service. We don't do anything on that week. 
uh, we, on a Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, or Saturday of the week of Thanksgiving so that folks can get out of town and be, spend some time with their families and things like that. And then uh, also keep in mind that uh, uh, Brother D. Keith had a birthday. If you think to, uh, send him a happy birthday wish there. And then Team uh, C for the cleaning ministry. God bless you. We sure do appreciate uh, your help and all of that. And uh, you see the results from last week. It's absolutely amazing that the, um, the missions, uh, what came in for missions there uh, is just nothing short of amazing. We just praise the Lord for that. God is just so tremendously good to us. And, uh, and I'm thankful that we'll be able to send every bit of that out uh, to our missionaries, help dig wells and do other things like that. Um, you handed me uh, that envelope and I probably left it on my desk. Do you remember the numbers, Miss Linda, of what, what, was, what was the missions uh, giving promises on the faith promise? For the month. Uh, and then for the year? Okay. And so just so everybody knows, that's way more than double what we were currently doing. And, uh, and so I think that's amazing. You know, I think what happened was we had some folks who weren't currently involved in Faith Promise Missions get involved. And that's great. And so I'm excited that between now and February, when we have our annual State of the Church address, uh, we'll be able to add on some missionaries and uh, to our current list of supported missionaries and then maybe even give to some missions projects and things like that. Uh, you know, special needs arise in the hearts and lives of these missionaries and we want to be able, we were able to do that last year. Uh, the Stanleys had a special need regarding a building and, uh, and we were able to just real quickly cut a check for a thousand, I think it was, and send it their way. And, uh, and we were able to do that a, a couple of times, I think, and my memory's failing me now, but uh, it's a blessing to be able to do that. And, uh, and then also, uh, in regards to the missions revival itself, that's not free. And when we have extra monies, we're able to do that. And by the way, our bus ministry is a part of our Faith Promise missions. We've always set it up that way. Uh, so the bus ministry is funded by Faith Promise missions. And so when you give to missions, you're giving to the bus ministry. And that's a blessing, too. Uh, uh, as we fill this bus up, you know, who knows what the Lord has in store for other routes and everything. I've always thought from the moment that I moved here that this community was set up perfectly for a bus ministry. I said, whoever built and designed this area where you have, you know, uh, the B section, the F section, et cetera, et cetera, uh, those are called bus routes. <laughs> you know, you have the F bus route, the B bus route, the C bus route and all of that. I mean, this place was designed for the bus ministry. And uh, I don't know if they know that or not, but, uh, but praise the Lord. Maybe one of these days we'll have A through Z routes, you know, and uh, what is that, about 52 according to Barack Obama's math? Uh, I'm kidding. Uh, was it 26 letters in the alphabet? I think that's right. And uh, so that'd be amazing, wouldn't it? 26 buses lined up, bus barn, bus mechanics, all that. Who knows what the Lord has in store, but it's all exciting stuff. We thank the Lord for it. All right, well, uh, uh, let's, uh, let's sing our chorus there. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. And uh, we'll take time to greet one another. Let folks know you're glad they're here this evening. Would you stand with me, please? And uh, we'll sing this song together. With the Mark will come lead us. And because he lives. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow.
cause he lives, I can face tomorrow, because he lives, all fear is gone, because I know, he holds the God bless you. you. May be seated. And uh, remind me to, I don't see offering plates back there. Do they not get brought back? All right. Well, remind me to do the offering at the close of the service, Brother Marco, please, if you don't mind. And uh, we will uh, sing this evening the quartet. And I really enjoyed that song that, that we sang this morning uh, about uh, Abraham, Isaac, you know. And uh, oh, I, I'd never, we'd never sung that before while well, we practiced it. But what a, what a beautiful song. Sing it again. <laughs> Turn around, Sam. <laughs> we could if you wanted us to. Uh, we had another one planned, but want us to do it again? We'll do it again. All right, Brother Jeremy, where's it at? What's the name of it? When I hold it. Huh? Oh, okay. Is it in alphabetical order? Yes, sir. All right, let's do it. <clears throat> Abraham prayed for the day that God would give him a son. Blessed Isaac was his name, the greatest gift he'd ever known. Then came the day Who would have dreamed God would say You gotta give them back to me And on this mountain You must prove That it's you with Isaac Or it's me and you So when I Lay my eyes down with a broken heart, but my father's proud. And on this altar where he lay, just to find that it wasn't him, God wanted me. Now most of us, I dare to say, oh, we've got an Isaac standing in God's way, but it's all this altar you can prove that it's not your Isaac that God wants, but he wants you. And when I lay my Isaac down with a broken heart, but my father's proud, and on this altar where he lay, just to find that it wasn't him, God wanted me. Cause when I lay With a broken heart, but my father's proud, and it's on this altar where he lays, just to find that it wasn't him, God wanted me.
and trust Him in His presence daily live. When I lay my eyes down with a broken heart, but my Father's proud, and it's on this altar where He lays, just to find that it wasn't Him God wanted me, and it's on this altar where He lays, just to find that it wasn't Him God wanted me. Praise the Lord. And now we're taking requests, apparently, Brother Jeremy. <laughs> Amen. Well, we got another one there lined up, but that's all right. That was a good one. And uh, praise the Lord. Take your Bible this evening, please, and turn with me to the book of Acts in chapter number six. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure we're all tired this evening, probably none as tired as I am, but that's all right. We're going to try to not take too much time uh, this evening. Uh, I want to lay the groundwork for this study on uh, the, 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 the biblical office of a deacon and, uh, and what this means. I want you to know that, uh, and not too terribly long from now, uh, we're going to do something that we've never done here at this church before. And we're going to be nominating some deacons uh, to serve uh, this congregation. And uh, in preparation for that time, I'd like for us to spend the next few Sunday evenings, uh, and we'll obviously have to skip one, it's a big Sunday, we'll uh, uh, be in the middle of this here, uh, but considering the office and the responsibility of the Baptist deacon. And so for our text tonight, we're going to find Acts in chapter number 6, Acts chapter number 6, and as is our custom, I would invite you to stand with me, please, out of the reverence for the reading of the Word of God, and Acts in chapter number 6, beginning there with verse number 1, your King James Bible says, and in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, if you're in the habit of marking things in your Bible, you may want to underscore that word multiplied. When the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God to serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out from among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenius, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch, whom they set before the apostles. And when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. And the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples, and there's that word again, multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. And a great company of priests, of the priests, were obedient to the faith. And Father, I pray that you'll please, Lord, help me. Uh, bless our time together. And uh, Father, I pray that we'll be able to teach some biblical principles here. And also, Lord, that I'll be able to somehow, Father, find a way to make the rubber meet the road here and make application in the hearts and lives of the people here. These are your children. They are the sheep of your pasture. And Father, how I pray that you'll feed your sheep tonight. Help me, dear Lord, to get out of your way and use me this evening, and I'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for standing. You may be seated. I believe today, unfortunately, there's a lot of confusion regarding the office of a deacon, the role or the function of deacons. Uh, you, you go from church to church, and, and there's different ideas of what the responsibilities are 
or what the role or the function of the deacon is. And I will tell you that as you go from maybe even denomination to denomination, uh, you'll find that people have different ideas of uh, the functionality of a deacon. Uh, let me just say this. I'm sincerely, from the bottom of my heart, not the least bit interested in tradition or teachings of men. All I'm interested in is what does the Bible say? That's always been where I stand. I think it's always a good idea if all of us all the time just agree that we are going to meet at the book. Let me make this statement, and you've heard it before, but I'll make it again. At this church, we believe that the Bible is our sole authority for faith, for all matters of faith and practice. The Bible is our sole authority for all matters of faith and, faith and practice. Now, you go to a lot of churches and you'll hear uh, that statement, but they don't use the word sole authority. They use the word final authority, as if to say there are other authorities for faith and practice. We are a biblicist, a, a church that is biblicist, bi a Baptist, and we're biblicists. And therefore, we do not have any other authorities for faith and practice. We don't have anything that's delivered down to us uh, from some hierarchy somewhere or some uh, Vatican or Babdican or anything like that. Amen. We get what we get from the Word of God. And so, uh, therefore, having, having known that, uh, everything that we get, we ought to come from the pages of the Word of God. And therefore, it is our sole authority, not our final authority, as if there are some other authorities, but the Bible just kind of supersedes the other authorities. No, it is our only authority for faith and practice. And, and there will be utmost unity if we always determine that we're just going to meet at the book. We're not going to meet at tradition. We're not going to meet at what somebody might be used to, you know, doing or whatnot. We'll just always just determine to meet at the book and we should all be of one accord. I believe that's the way that the Lord wants it for every uh, single church. And, uh, and so we will not concern ourselves with what other men have said about the deacon and his role in the church. We'll only concern ourselves with what does the Bible have to say. And uh, uh, the, this passage of Acts in chapter number six uh, you'll find something unique is it, when somebody preaches on deacons, they'll obviously come to Acts 6 and they'll go to 1 Timothy chapter 3. But I'll remind you, it's interesting uh, tidbit. You didn't see the word deacon in Acts chapter number 6 at all. Uh, however, it is commonly known uh, amongst those who study the word of God that, uh, that this is the appointment of the first deacons. Although, although the word is not used here in Acts in chapter number 6, uh, you see it starts with a 12, and that would be pastor and assistant pastors. And, uh, and then you see they, they charge the church, the congregation, with looking uh, from among themselves men that were filled with the Holy Ghost. And that's uh, the first formation of the deacon there, as you see there. Now, let me, let, me, let me show you this. First off, we'll look at the problems that the church had faced. In, in Acts chapter 6 and verse number 1, uh, the Bible says here, And in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. And so you see here just right away in verse number one that there are a couple of problems that this first century church here uh, was facing. And, uh, and so uh, we must never forget that um, uh, the devil does not like the local New Testament church. It's God's plan. And so where you have a church that is trying to do something for the Lord, you are always going to have problems. There's no escaping that. And uh, certainly it's not for the faint of heart. Uh, there's no pain-free way of serving the Lord. There's no way you're going to get through serving God without having your heart broken once or twice. That's just the way that it goes. When you have two uh, or more people, you have the potential for trouble no matter what. <laughs> when you have, uh, in fact, I heard, I heard the story of a man who was on a desolate island all by himself. And, uh, and there he was on this island, uh, you know... Uh, on this deserted island alone. And finally, ultimately, there was a ship that came to his rescue. And the ship pulled to the island, and, uh, and they said, man, how long have you been here? He said, about 10 years. And they said, my, we're so glad we found you, and all of this, you know. And, and, and they saw these three buildings, and they said, what are these buildings? He said, well, that one is my house. And they said, well, that's wonderful. They said, what is this building? He said, that one's my church. 
And they said, well, then what's this building here? He said, well, that's the church I used to go to. <laughs> you know, <laughs> There's a lot of truth to that, man. You know, you do your very best, but it's just, their trouble comes your way. And when it does, it must be faced head on and it must be dealt with. Not allowed to simmer, not allowed to brew. That's always a bad idea. You just have to deal with things as they come and, and problems come. And it was no different for this church here. And the first century church here, you see in verse number one, they dealt with a couple of problems. The first problem they dealt with was the problem of multiplication. You see it there. It says, in the, and, and in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, God had made a transition. In fact, if you look in your Bible in Acts chapter two, uh, uh, real quickly, in Acts chapter two, the Bible says in verse, uh, well, in verse number 46, in Acts two and verse number 46, and they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people and the Lord. And now I want you to notice this word added to the church daily, such as should be saved. So in Acts chapter number two and verse number 47, you see that the Holy Spirit was adding to the church. And by the time you go from Acts chapter number 2 and verse 47 to Acts in chapter number 6, you find that the Lord transitions from adding to multiplying. <laughs> the church was growing exponentially at this point. In fact, the problem with multiplication at this point, if you remember at the day of Pentecost, there were, there were 3,000 men that were saved at Pentecost. And then later there was another 5,000 men that were saved uh, just a short time thereafter. Now, if you take this 8,000 men that were saved and added to the church and you begin to add wives and children uh, to that number uh, there, you have a number somewhere between 20,000 and 50,000 people that were added to the church. That's a lot of people. Now, let me just say this. I don't know that God ever wants our church to be that large. I am not interested in that at all. Uh, I don't think that I could effectively pastor that many people. Uh, and, and I don't have an interest in that. <laughs> more people, more problems. But, uh, but uh, let's split it up and let someone else bear some burden, you know. But let me show you what the Lord uh, said in Acts 1.8. If you look at Acts 1.8, this was the Lord's commandment. Before he began to multiply the church, before the Lord began to multiply the church in this exponential way, God commanded them in Acts 1.8, but ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all of Judea and in Samaria and in the uttermost parts of the earth. God had already had a solution in mind for the problem of multiplication. God's solution was go. Leave. Don't stick around. <laughs> God's solution was go into Jerusalem and into all of Judea and into Samaria uh, and, in, and in the uttermost parts of the earth. God was telling this first century church, I did not save you just for you to sit. I saved you for you to serve. And there are people in the uttermost parts of the earth that need to hear about the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want you to get up off of your blessed assurance and roll up your sanctified sleeves, take off your sanctified coat and get busy for the cause of Christ. He was commissioning them to go, but they did not go. They stayed. And so you have this problem with multiplication. Now you have a lot of cooks in the kitchen. You got a, a problem here. God had that, <clears throat> that solution already, but they did not listen. They did not listen to God's solution. And so God later finds a solution himself. Uh, in fact, go beyond our text, if you will. You see the problem in Acts chapter 6 was the problem of multiplication. But go to Acts chapter number 8. Acts chapter number 8. You see the problem was or the solution was found for them. If they would have done what God wanted them to do, they, they, they could have manufactured their own solution in Acts 1.8. But because they refused to manufacture their own solution and they all stuck around in Jerusalem, God created a solution for them and he just flip-flopped that verse. So we went from Acts 1.8 to Acts 8.1. So look at what Acts 8.1 says. 
It says, and Saul was consenting unto his death. At that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. Does that sound familiar? What did God do? God said, go. And they said, we'd rather stay. <laughs> We're enjoying uh, what's happening here. And God said, go. And they said, we want to stay. And so God says, all right, then I'll allow great persecution to come. And did you notice where they scattered? They scattered in the same locations of what Acts 1.8 said. <laughs> God got the people where he needed to get the people. One way or another, God's going to get obedience there. And he certainly did there. But there's this problem with multiplication there. And, uh, and so as a church grows, there grows a, a problem. Back in our text, as the church was growing, there grew a problem uh, with multiplication. You get more people, more people does. No matter what, how you slice it, more people is more problems. And so they were trying to figure out a solution at this point between Acts 1-8 and Acts 8-1. This is the solution. The solution was, let's find some people to help us to manage some of these problems because the man of God is trying to do what the man of God is supposed to do, but there are fires. He's a fireman putting out fires all day long. And so this was a solution to the first problem, the problem of multiplication. Now look at the second problem, same verse, Acts 6-1. And in those days, when the number of the disciples multiplied, uh, there arose a murmuring. So you see the problem of multiplication. And the second problem you see is the problem of murmuring. There was a problem of multiplication and there was a problem of murmuring. Now, you see the two different groups there at the church. Uh, it says, of the Grecians against the Hebrews. You know, And so you see these two different um, sects, if you will, of Jews that were there, and, uh, and, 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 and some were native to Israel, and, uh, and they were Greek-speaking uh, Hellenistic Jews that were also there, and basically they were, they were clicking themselves together, and they were formulating cliques, you know, and then they were murmuring against one another. That's not healthy, you know, uh, not healthy whatsoever. When you have a church, you have a church. You don't have multiple churches within a church. And it should never be that there are cliques within a church. It should be that, that this is one church body or any church is one church body and that everybody within that church body uh, gets along and everybody uh, is welcome to anything that anybody is doing uh, because it is one church family. We have to be so very careful. Uh, sometimes we can allow ourselves to form an old guard. Well, I was here a long time, you know, and, uh, or, or form a new guard or whatever it may be. And uh, as God continues to prosper and grow and build his church, we thank the Lord for it because the way I look at it, more people, yes, more problems, but more people equals more servants. More servants to serve the Lord, not me. More servants to get the cause of Christ done. More servants to see more people saved. You understand it all makes sense. And, uh, and so with that, oh, we have to be so very careful. Uh, I, 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 my desire, and I know it's your desire too, is that the Flagler County Baptist Church be the friendliest church in town. I mean, when people come here, I want them to think that these people are almost crazy how friendly they are. Nobody's this nice, you know? And, uh, and we want to be that way. We want to be friendly and we want to be welcoming. And that actually, you have to be cognizant. This is something you have to do on purpose. You have to set out to do it because it's not necessarily in our nature. Our nature is, is, is we're creatures of habit. Let me ask you this. How many people are sitting in the exact same place you sat this morning? Don't be afraid. Raise your hand. Be honest. I'll be more honest than that. You know, I am anyway. Simeon is in a sound booth, you know. And uh, uh, how many, you know, you come into church and you kind of know approximately where you sit. How about that? That's a little better there. That's everybody. God bless you, man. Somebody's in my sleep, man. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and, good. Good night. But, uh, but anyways, why is that? When I walked into the church growing up, when I grew up there at the church with my grandma, uh, we always knew. We're going all the way to the right, going up that aisle, five rows back. That's where we sit. <laughs> you know, we sit right there with grandma. That is our seat. 
And, uh, and, and I mean, I guess somebody could dare sit in it and she would be totally polite about the whole thing. Uh, our name wasn't on it, but there was a couple in our church. They were called the Popes and they weren't related to the Pope and, and the Vatican or nothing, but that was their last names. And they, when the church was getting going, uh, they, they were asking people if they would sponsor a pew and they sponsored a pew and they had a plaque made and had the plaque put on their pew and that's the pew they sat in and it had their name in it. <laughs> you know, so, anyways, uh, but, uh, but we're creatures of habit. And if we're not careful, what we do is we gravitate to the people that we always gravitate to, the same people. And then before you know it, you don't mean to, but you're leaving other people out. And you didn't mean to do it, but you formed a clique. And so that's what we're saying. We just have to be awful careful that, that, that we go to everybody. And this is something you have to be cognizant of. You have to be aware. When you walk into that church building, uh, into the church house, you, you have to determine, hey, I'm, I'm not just going to uh, uh, gravitate to the same uh, person or group of people. I'm going to butterfly myself to the other side. And, 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 and hey, let's, let's be a family, not a family with different cliques within it. I'm not saying that's a problem. You know, I hope it's not. I'm just saying, hey, this is all one big church family and we all love one another. And then when somebody walks in for the first time, we salivate. We got to I mean, we're chasing after him. How you doing? Good to have you. And all make yourself so friendly. Go up to visitors. They, I'm telling you, they'll come to church to check us out, but they will stay because they made a friend. Uh, there, there's a young, young man that came the other day and, 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 and they weren't going to be able to come today. Uh, I believe they're going to be here Wednesday night. Uh, but, but as a mother and her son, her teenage son, and I was so proud of our teenagers. Every one of them went over to him and introduced themselves to him. And uh, we, we all could have taken a notepad and a pencil and watched our teenagers as they went up to this young man and they just, just, just bombarded him. He never felt so loved, I'm sure, anywhere he's ever gone. And as a result, he even went to the youth activity Friday night. And, uh, and I believe he had a good time. I don't see him today, but I think he's going to be out of town today. <clears throat> but anyways, um, he loved it. They loved it. And I think we might have just got a family from it. And, and it came. They checked us out. But they made a friend. And all that's so very important. Uh, you're going to have problems. And so this first century church, they had a problem with multiplication. More people, more problems. They also had a problem with murmuring. Uh, and the Bible tells us they were murmuring. That word murmuring means a secret debate or whispering. Secret debate or whispering. And, uh, and, and people were talking about others in a negative manner behind their backs. And friend, that's always a problem. It's not a good thing to get in the habit of talking negatively behind somebody's back. The truth of the matter is we're supposed to be edifying one another. And hey, we can all be guilty. May God help us to, to, to we, we, we're all robed in flesh. We're all robed in flesh. And we have an old nature. And our old sinful nature is not eradicated. And that old man, he doesn't want to focus on the positive and build people up. He wants to tear down. And so we have to shoo him away, die to self, and we have to say, hey, I would rather speak positively and openly than speak negatively and whispering uh, behind somebody's back. There is nothing fruitful that's going to come from that. And the truth of the matter is, that is certainly a tactic of the devil to destroy a church. And don't be a tool in the hand of the devil to destroy a church. You remember when your mama used to tell you, if you ain't got nothing nice to say, then what? Don't, Don't say nothing, nothing at, all. at all. That's some good, sound advice. And uh, praise the Lord for that. Uh, but this is what the devil does. This is how he tries to destroy, does not like when God is at work. Now, the devil had already began his attack on this church at Jerusalem. Uh, he had already began the attack in two different ways. Uh, the, their persecution did not start in Acts chapter 8. Uh, if you take the time, and we won't this evening, but you can see their persecution was in Acts chapter 4. Uh, you can see the, basically the whole chapter. Uh, you see more persecution in Acts chapter number 5. 
And uh, so, so the devil said, here, I want to destroy this great work that God has going on. And so the devil said, I'm going I'm to send persecution to them. And, uh, and here they are. They're just getting rolling. They're deciding they want to serve God. They're going to the next step in their Christian life. They're, they're doing more for God. They're changing gears. They're doing more for God. And guess what happens? As they're growing in grace and they're doing more for God, troubles. Does that sound uncommon? I think I know what they're going through. I've been there every time I've ever stepped out to do something more for God. It's been met with troubles and trials. But friend, I'll remind you of this. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. When, I'm telling you something. God is good no matter what. But, uh, but anyway, so, so he tried to, to attack them through persecution. And then he tried to attack them by introducing sin into the church. And uh, you see that in Acts chapter number 5. Uh, <clears throat> well, for sake of time, I don't know if we want to read it, but how about verse number 1? You'll know exactly what the story is about. But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, and then it goes on from there. And, uh, and uh, you know what they did there? They sold a possession. And, and uh, it wasn't bad that they, uh, that they gave what they gave. They didn't have to give 100%. That was never uh, a qualifier. That was never a requirement. But certainly you weren't supposed to lie about it. And that was the problem. They lied to the Holy Ghost. They said, we sold this property for X amount of dollars. And so we are giving all X of it in the offering. When in reality, they sold it for Y. And they only gave X. And they kept Y. And they lied about it. That was the problem. They were introducing sin into the church. And, uh, and oh my, you can only imagine what would have been the motivating factors in the life of Ananias and Sapphira, uh, you know, maybe wanting the notoriety or whatever it may be. But God wanted his church to be holy. God wanted his church to be pure. And he wasn't going to have any time for that. And so, so, so Satan had tried to attack the church uh, by, by, by way of persecution. And then he tried to attack the church by introducing sin. And uh, both attacks failed because you know that, the, that <laughs> as we get to our text, the church just kept growing exponentially. And so Satan's attacks was a failure. And Satan said, well, I'll persecute them. And they grew. <clears throat> All right, well, I'll try to send sin in the camp. They took care of it. Ananias drops dead. Sapphira drops dead. Church is purified, bang, bang, church grows, boom, <laughs> you know, and so the devil's, what am I going to do? He tried to destroy the church from without, and he realized that it wasn't going to work, and so he changed his tactic to trying to destroy the church from within, and, uh, and that's what you see back in our text in Acts chapter number six with the murmuring. The murmuring that was going on uh, there, and, uh, and the same is true today. If the devil cannot infiltrate us and attack us from without, you can rest assured that he's going to do his dead level best to try to destroy the church from within. And that's what was happening here. And uh, he's going to do everything he can do to try to divide a church that's growing and doing something for God. He's going to, you know, the old saying, divide and conquer. We always say this in America, united we stand, divided we fall, right? Have you ever seen a day and age in which we've been so divided as we are in our land? I mean, you'd have to go back to the days of the Civil War. Why do you reckon there's so much division? Where do you think it's coming from? Spiritual wickedness in high places. This country is trying to be destroyed, and they're trying to do it by getting us to divide against one another. And they're doing a good job. You know, uh, no doubt about it. But what, what lies true for the country also lies true for the church. And that is united we stand, divided we fall. A house divided cannot stand is a more scriptural way of putting it. Uh, we have to make sure that the church of the living God uh, is, is in unity. This first century church, this church here at Jerusalem, they were a church that was known for their unity. As you read throughout Acts, you'll see that reoccurring uh, theme. They were all 
of one accord. One accord. You see this unity there. And, uh, and there is no place for anger in the local church. There is no place for unforgiveness in the local church. There is no place for division in the local church. There is no place for trouble in the local church. That is the kind of thing that will destroy a body of Christ, the church. We have to be so very careful. The church, if it's going to thrive, it'll have to be a church of unity. So you see, they had a problem of multiplication. They had a problem of murmuring. And they also had a problem of ministry. Of ministry. The Greek-speaking widows were not getting their share of the daily food and supply. And the early church was committed to meeting the needs of its members. But because of the growth of the church, the multiplication, the other problems... There were people that were being neglected. And, uh, and so they had to figure out what they were going to do. Let's look at verse number six. It says that in those days, uh, verse number one, I'm sorry, of chapter six. And in those days when the number of the disciples were multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because of the, the widows, because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. And so there's this problem with ministry. Ministry. The widows were not being taken care of. The widows were being neglected. Now, you have to think about the ministry, and I'm probably going to try to wrap it up here even though I'm not near finished, but the ministry has to have priorities. Now, if you have somebody who is in a hospital and they really need somebody to come alongside of them and pray with them, some of you have been on your way to surgery, and I've prayed with you, you know, um, and that's good. As the church grows, there's only so much one man can do before he spreads so thin that he breaks, you know, and that's not a good thing either. And so what do you do? They looked out from among themselves deacons. Now we'll talk about what that word deacon means at another time because it'll probably blow your mind as we just make sure we get everything we get from the Bible. But the purpose of the deacon was to come alongside of the pastor and relieve some of his load in the order of service because of this whole thing of priorities. Now we have to have a priority. If I were to, or any pastor for that matter, were to spend his day uh, at a hospital waiting in a waiting room for three hours as somebody goes back for surgery, waiting for them to come back and all of this, and, uh, and then from there hops over and, and goes and helps somebody move, and I've helped a lot of you move, you know, and, uh, and then goes over and helps this and helps that and does all these other things. Man, martyrs are laughing because some of you I've helped move more than once. And, uh, but, uh, but anyways, um, you know, we, we've, 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 we've done these things and we do these things and that's great and you want to be able to do these things. But then also, somebody has got to be ready, prayed up, studied up. Studied up is a very big deal. You know, to write a new sermon for me, if it's a good one, <laughs> you know, six hours plus. For a new sermon, you know, when you're planning a, a church like this, honestly, sometimes you just get whatever time you can and you just do your best and you say, God, help me, <laughs> you know, and because uh, you're just so busy. But the truth of the matter is, if I'm to do right by God and do right by God's people, I really should spend, I know what it takes me to write a good sermon and what it takes for me to develop a message. I know what kind of time it takes. So now I could be sitting in a hospital room waiting, and I don't mind, and I'll keep doing that. And I could be helping somebody move or all that, or, which I'm helping one individual, and I'm helping one individual, and I'm helping one individual. Or what I can do is I can give myself to study and prayer and all of that so that I can help everybody. And if I don't do that, and I just give myself and spread myself so thin where I'm just doing these, and please don't think I'm, I'm saying I, I don't want you to ask me for help. Don't get that from this at all. I, that's what I love. That's my heart. That is my heart. I love helping people. That's why if any of you have ever asked me, I've been like, I'm going to be there, and I want to be there. I'm just telling you that in this thing of when it comes to priorities, uh, you know, if we get a little help, if I just get a little help, and I get some people that can go and help me out with some of these things, then I can give more time to this so that I can help 
more people. And so that's got to be the priority. The priority must always be the preaching of the Word of God. That's the priority. I'm not trying to state that my position is anything big or to be desired or anything. I hope you don't take this the wrong way. But I know the importance of preaching, and so do you. Let's just be honest. You've read your Bible, and you know the importance of preaching the Word of God. And so therefore, that must be my priority to make sure that I am prayed up and I am ready to do what God wants me to do. And in order for that to happen, you cannot spread yourself thin. You've got to get some help. And, uh, and so uh, I believe that we are at the place or we're getting to the place. We're getting to that place. And that's why I say, let's just go ahead and do it now where uh, I can help you now. And I don't mind. But as the church continues to grow right now, we're in the days of addition. But if the Lord should see fit to move us to the days of multiplication, I, I, I will probably drop dead in the pulpit. I won't be able to take it. I need help. And so that's the purpose of it. The purpose of the deacon is to come alongside and lift up the arms of Moses and to help. We'll talk about what the purpose of the deacon is not. And, uh, and we're going to get everything from the Bible. Everything is going to come from this book. And, uh, and I think that'll be most helpful. But all I desire to do with my life is to please the Lord and have a church that is the most biblical church it can possibly be. And so I want you to begin now to pray. Uh, you can say, well, I, you mean pray about who I want to nominate to be deacon? You know, I don't even need you to do that right now. I want you to determine that you want to get as close to God as you can right now over the next several weeks. Because this is really, in my opinion, a big deal. And, and I think people ought to be prayed up and walking with God. Because the Bible is very, very, very certain about the qualifications of a deacon. And, uh, and, and God wouldn't have these very spiritual qualifications if it wasn't a spiritual position. And so may God help us as we pray about these things in the next coming weeks. Father, I love you now and thank you for your many wonderful blessings. Lord, if there was any application here tonight... I guess the application would be that we need to walk with God, all of us. Lord, the application would be that we need to make sure that we put away murmuring, we put away clicks, we open ourselves up to meeting people and becoming friends with people and welcoming and, 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 and talking to people that we don't normally talk to and, and, and being a church of one accord not being two or three or four churches inside of one building. And Father, I pray that that will be the case. And Father, I pray that you'll continue to bless. I pray that everybody in here knows how much I love each and every one of them. And I pray that's the same thing for each one of them, that they love us all the same. Father, how we pray that you'll just continue to bless and grow and build your church. Lord, we're excited about the growth. We're excited about what you've done. And uh, it's, it's exciting days. It really is. I pray, dear Lord, that you'll help us to just always be ready and Lord, help me. I want to walk with you. I want to be close to you. And please, Lord, I pray that you'll help me guide my steps so that I never venture away from walking in the center of your, your will for my life. Bless these, your children. And Father, I pray that you'll bless this time of invitation now. We ask it in Jesus' name. Stand together, please. Our heads are bowed. Our eyes are closed. If you want to come and pray for your church tonight, that's probably a good idea. If you want to come and pray for yourself, that's probably a good idea. But as, however the Lord leads you tonight, if you'd step out from where you are, you come pray for this local church that God's allowed you to be a part of. God's seen fit to bring this church into your life. And what God needs from you in this last century church is some believers that walk with God. And may we walk with God tonight. That's the most important thing. Walking with the Lord. Walking with the Lord. Being right with God.
this song that Brother Jeremy's playing, and we'll let the ushers come forward as we sing this good song here, Lord, I'm Coming Home. It's 162 if you want to sing with us. I wandered far away from God. Now I'm coming home. The paths of sin too long I've trod. Lord, I'm coming home. Coming. Amen. Brother Marco, lead us in prayer for the offering this evening, please. Dear Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for another great Sunday, Lord, at Flagler County Baptist Church. Thank you for uh, speaking to my heart tonight, Lord. And just thank you, Lord, for allowing us to be a part of such a great church and yes, such Lord. a great spirit. Thank you, Lord, for uh, giving me this extended family. And I just I thank you, Lord, for this preacher, his family. And I pray, Lord, that tonight uh, we just be willing to give uh, just... Uh, something, Lord, that you've given to us, Lord. I just pray, Lord, that we we, uh, we do it and we surrender uh, whatever we have to mm. you, Lord. And I just pray, Lord, just be with us. Help uh, whatever comes in, Lord, to just uh, go and, and do something great for the Father of Christ, for your cause. I pray, Lord, just be with us, not just today, but throughout the rest of our lives. In your name we pray. Amen. Hey, let's stay standing for the offering. We'll be on our way out after this. of the Lord today. I've really enjoyed myself today. Tuckered myself out a little bit, but that's always good. You ought to be tired on Sunday. And, uh, but praise the Lord. And, uh, and, and it was a good day all the way around. And uh, Miss Linda, we had a good offering this morning. And uh, yeah, uh, I don't know where it all come from, but either way, I said this morning, I said, as we get to that $100,000 mark, you know, we'll look into buying a building. And I said, I think we're at 96. She goes, no, she brought me back down to 80, but I think we got back up. Maybe a hundred thousand. We had a great offering this morning, about ten thousand dollars, and uh, so yeah, if the checks clear, I guess with their checks, I don't know if it's cash. Somebody's a drug dealer, but <laughs> I don't know what it is. But uh, if it's cash, walk her to her car, somebody, <laughs> and watch her, because I don't trust her. I'm just, I'm only kidding. Oh, it's been good to be in the house of the Lord. I tell you, what a good day. Lot, lots going on. We're just so thankful for it. What God's doing. Just be in prayer for us, and uh, we'll be praying for you. All right, well, let's sing the windows of heaven are open. The blessing of fall tonight. And if I could meet with uh, the, the officers and trustees just back there in the security room, that would be great. Just five minutes. Let's sing together. Ready? The windows of heaven are open. The blessings are falling tonight. There's joy. Jesus made everything right. I gave him my old tattered garment. He gave me a robe of pure white. I'm feasting on manna from heaven, and that's why I'm happy tonight. God bless you. I love you. You're dismissed. Thank you so much for being a part of our church service. I hope you enjoyed the message and the music and all that was involved in the church service today. Now listen, something very important is knowing the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. If you'll visit our website, the web address is www.fcbc.biz. If you go to our website, there's a tab, a drop-down bar, and on it, it says the word salvation. If you'll click on that word salvation, it'll pull up a web page that tells you how you can know for sure you're going to heaven. In fact, it tells you how to be born again. That's most important. Everybody needs to know how to be born again. I hope you'll take the time to read through that. And if you've never trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, I hope that you'll do that. And listen, if you're ever in the area, we'd love for you to come by and visit with us here at the great Flagler County Baptist Church.
Tell everyone about us. God bless you. Thanks for being a part.